Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, wherever you are, um, and welcome to this online seminar hosted by the Institute for Sustainable Resources at University College London. We feel enormously privileged uh, that we're able to host today uh, the Chief Executive of the UK Environment Agency, Sir James Bevan, uh, and he's going to be talking about a subject that is enormously close to my heart, namely the relationship between the health of humans and the health of the environment. It's particularly close to my heart because over the last three or four years, uh, I was one of two global co-chairs of the United Nations Environment Programme's um, Global Environment Outlook, the sixth edition of this, which was entitled Healthy Planet, Healthy People, and it made absolutely clear that this relationship between human health and environmental health is fundamental. The thought that we can have healthy humans on a planet that is not healthy uh, is clearly out of the question. And there was an enormous amount of evidence globally that the health of a planet is in very grave question and is already inflicting very great damage on human health. So um, this uh, today we're now going to focus down on uh, the situation in the UK um, and uh, I've had a quick sneak uh, peek at the important publication that the Environment Agency is launching uh, simultaneously with this seminar and many of the subjects which I became familiar with uh, at the global level uh, are uh, very much reflected. Uh, in what uh, Sir James is going to say today. So it's an enormous pleasure to have him with us. Uh, he's an extremely uh, eminent person. He's been the UK High Commissioner to India. He's been the Chief Operating Officer of the UK Foreign Office. Uh, he has an academic track record as having been a visiting fellow at the Center for International Affairs at Harvard University, and he's had a number of other senior posts in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, including posts in Washington, Paris, and Brussels. He's an alumnus of the University of Sussex, uh, which is at least one link between him and the discussant, uh, whom we will hear from in a minute after he's spoken. Uh, and uh, he was awarded a knighthood in 2012. So James, we, are, we feel very privileged to have you with us and uh, we're very much looking forward to what you have to say. Uh, what I need to say on the uh, domestic front is that um, uh, we're very much hoping that we will have a lively question and answer session, uh, but we can only have a lively question and answer session if you ask some questions. You will see that there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, this is live, so when Sir James says something that you want to respond to, or even if you have a question that you want to put up there a priori before he started, please feel free to do so. We've got some people monitoring them. And then when the Q&A session comes along, uh, I will look at those and I will choose uh, the ones that seem to me to be um, most important, most relevant or whatever. Uh, if we can't get through them all, uh, I apologize, but uh, we have got 140 people now online listening and uh, obviously if you all ask questions then we shall have a fabulous time but I'm not going to be able to uh, get through them all. So with that no further ado, um, Sir James Bevan over to you for your talk on um, the health of the planet and the health of people. Well uh, Professor Eakin's colleagues um, thanks very much uh, for having me. It's, it's my honour um, I think not yours. Um, to be with you as a guest of uh, the Institute for Sustainable Resources. Um, good leaders uh, admit vulnerability. So uh, let me start by saying I feel rather outgunned uh, in front of uh, you and, uh, and your distinguished audience. Um, uh, you don't need me to tell you, but I will anyway, that UCL is one of the best universities in the world. Uh, the uh, Bartlett, um, uh, your faculty of the built environment, number one in the UK, um, uh, third in the world. Uh, I'm also very conscious that Immediately after this speech, I'm going to be followed by someone who knows a lot more about this than I do, um, which is Professor Chatterway. Um, uh, all I have um, is a bit of practitioner's knowledge, um, and 
a big personal commitment to the Environment Agency's purpose, which is to create uh, a better place. So uh, if anyone has tuned in hoping for a brilliant academic discourse from me, I advise them to look away now. Um, I've got three messages that I want to land with you all. Um, message one, uh, as you've just said, uh, Paul, a healthy environment uh, means healthy humans. Uh, and the converse is true. Uh, an unhealthy environment means unhealthy humans. That sounds obvious, but it's only now that we're starting to see the detailed evidence that really backs it up. And today the Environment Agency is publishing a report which adds to that body of evidence and helps us understand, I hope, just a bit better how the environment does affect human health and well-being. Uh, message two, investing in a healthy environment is about the smartest thing we could do. Uh, it makes medical sense because it will mean better health for all of us and less strain on our medical services. We think it makes economic sense because uh, we estimate the NHS could save more than £2 billion pounds every year in treatment costs if everyone in England just had access to good quality green space. And we think it makes social sense to invest uh, in a healthy environment because those who live in poor environments are also those who have the worst health outcomes and the lowest incomes. And so leveling up the environment will also help level up everything else. Uh, third message, which is a bit cheeky, but I'll give it to you anyway. Um, the Environment Agency is not uh, the National Health Service. We don't uh, claim to be, but I do think that in doing what we do, which is to protect and enhance the environment, that we are also providing a National Health Service with, not with capitals, but with uh, small letters. So um, let me start with the report that you mentioned uh, that we're publishing today. It's called The State of the Environment, um, Health, People and the Environment. It does exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, the main findings are that air pollution is the single biggest environmental threat to health in the UK. It shortens tens of thousands of lives every year. Um, uh, that environmental factors, other ones, pollution, flooding, climate change, uh, are also contributing not just to uh, increase in physical uh, health issues, but in mental health conditions. Um, as I've said, uh, exposure to pollution and access to nature is not equally distributed um, across society. Um, we know that people living in deprived areas often have uh, worse environments with less access to green space. They also have worse, worse health. There is a link. On the upside, uh, which is also in the report, there is a substantial piece of evidence that uh, everyone's uh, physical and mental health benefits uh, from a good environment. So uh, put simply, if we look after nature, it will look after us. Now, um, just a few points of detail from the report. Um, uh, start with the good news. The good news is that uh, the overall quality of the environment in which we live in, at least this country, uh, is much better than it was even a few decades ago. That's down to a combination of uh, stronger laws, uh, a cleaner economy, better policies, popular demand uh, and effective regulation, much of it actually by the Environment Agency. So, uh, for example, air is much cleaner um, than it was. Um, emissions of some of the worst air pollutions, air pollutants have been massively uh, reduced. Um, just to give you some numbers, between 1970 and 2017, sulfur oxides emissions down by 97%, uh, PM10, so that's larger particulate matter, down by 73%, uh, fine particulate matter, a particular concern for, uh, for uh, breathing difficulties, down by 79%. Uh, and uh, uh, although I wasn't there, uh, I was, hadn't been born, but I do know about it, in 1952, it's just worth remembering um, that thousands of people in London died as a result of what was called the Great Smog, uh, the smoky fog which led to the Clean Air Act. Now, um, I would bet you that most Londoners today probably have never even heard of smog, and I think that shows you how far we've come on air quality. So the air's better, uh, water is cleaner, um, in particular water in our, uh, off our coasts uh, is cleaner. Um, land uh, that was once heavily polluted by uh, big industrial processes has been re remediated and uh, we are less exposed than we were to some of the most dangerous chemicals uh, in the environment uh, such as um, dioxins. So all that's good, uh, even better, as again, you don't need me to tell you, um, everyone in this country pretty much now has decent sanitation, they have safe drinking water, and taken together with uh, the huge advances in healthcare over the last few decades, uh, the net effect has been a dramatic and hugely welcome improvement in most people's health, well-being, and life expectancy. 
Now that's the good news. Uh, you said that I uh, lived in India. I did. One of the lessons I learned there is that things are never quite as bad or quite as good as uh, you think they are. So let me get to the bad news, um, which is that the progress on all the issues that I've identified, and it is real progress, has thrown other risks, some old and some new, into sharper relief. So air again. Despite all that progress, um, as I said, air pollution is the single greatest environmental threat now to health uh, in the UK. Um, an estimated 5% of the total mortality in England uh, can be attributed to PM 2.5, that fine particulate matter alone. Noise, uh, people don't think about noise, but noise actually causes the second highest pollution related burden of disease in Western Europe. It actually is responsible for more life years lost than physical pollutants like lead, uh, ozone, uh, or the dioxins. It's been linked to coronary heart disease, to dementia, to diabetes and obesity. Uh, the main source is road traffic. Um, uh, over 11 million people in England uh, are exposed to volume from traffic that exceeds WHO guidelines. Um, odour. Um, uh, we deal quite a lot in the Environment Agency with complaints about uh, smells from uh, farming, industry, waste sites, um, they're not just unpleasant, they don't just harm people's quality of life, they harm their health as well. Um, because the research shows that communities that are affected by odour also experience higher levels of anxiety and stress-related illness. Finally, flooding. Um, one of the EA's main jobs is to reduce flood risk in this country. We do that pretty successfully, but we can't prevent all flooding. And when it happens, um, it does have serious health effects. Um, not just to physical health, uh, though it does uh, cause higher levels of shock, uh, respiratory infections, higher blood pressure uh, in those who have experienced it. The biggest of all effects, uh, if you get flooded, is on your mental health. So there are significantly increased uh, incidences of depression, uh, anxiety and post-traumatic stress um, in people who have experienced a flood. Bottom line, um, the World Health Organization estimates that environmental factors like those contribute about 14, 1-4% of the total disease burden in the UK. Uh, it gets worse. Um, uh, the the uh, health damage of bad environments are felt unequally. Uh, they fall mostly on the most deprived and on black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. So um, life expectancy, for example, the number of years uh, healthy life expectancy, the number of years that we live in good health, uh, the difference in healthy life expectancy between the most and the least deprived areas of England, uh, which are also often the most polluted environments, uh, is currently around 19 years, one nine. So just think about that. Whether you get nearly two extra decades uh, of good health depends on where you live and your level of material comfort. There's also, as I've said, racial inequality here in terms of uh, access to nature and the health benefits that that brings. Uh, a study that we cite in the report uh, found that uh, communities with 40% or more black, Asian uh, or ethnic minority residents uh, have access to 11 times less, 11 times fewer uh, green spaces uh, than those uh, areas that comprise mainly white residents. So one final depressing fact before I try and cheer you up, um, which is this, uh, the climate emergency will make all of this worse. Uh, we will see uh, heat related deaths uh, increase, uh, possibly to up to 7,000 a year by the mid 2050s. Uh, there will be an increase in air pollution, fires with all the respiratory damage that causes, flooding, coastal erosion, drought, etc. All of those uh, with consequences for mental and physical health. So. Uh, so much for the gloom. Uh, the good news is that we know how to solve these problems. Uh, we know uh, that drinking clean water, um, breathing clean air and living on uncontaminated land are pretty important ingredients for long and healthy lives. Uh, we know that green environments enhance health and well-being. Uh, a study of over 19,000 people in England uh, found that uh, people who spent two hours or more a week uh, in open green spaces were significantly more likely to uh, report good health uh, or high well-being. Uh, we know that a blue environment uh, living near a coast or a river or a lake is even better for you than uh, a green one. Um, proximity to the coast in particular appears to be associated with less obesity and higher uh, overall health. Uh, and we know that spending time in nature doesn't just uh, benefit your general health but it also improves how you feel 
about life. So um, Natural England, our sister organisation, who run a regular survey monitoring the time that people spend in the natural environment. Um, their latest report shows that people who visit nature at least once a week are nearly twice as likely to say that uh, their lives are worthwhile uh, and worth living than those uh, with low nature connectedness. Um, we also know that uh, the nature on which our health ultimately relies is an integrated system. Uh, in order for it to work optimally, every bit of it has to work, uh, which is why the Environment Agency's um, new five-year action plan, which we've just launched, uh, commits my organisation to improve uh, all the key elements uh, of that environment. So that's air, land and water, and it commitment, commits us to tackle um, the biggest of all threats to the environment, which is the climate emergency. Uh, what are we doing about this? Well, um, the government uh, is, is acting. Uh, the government's got a clean air strategy, uh, for example, which sets out some pretty comprehensive plans to tackle um, what I said uh, was the biggest single environmental uh, threat to people's health. Um, the government's also set out a pretty audacious goal uh, for nature, which is that we will be the first uh, generation to leave uh, the natural environment in a better state than we found it. Um, it's produced an ambitious 25-year plan uh, to deliver that. There is a bill uh, now before Parliament, which, uh, assuming it becomes law, will make provision to enshrine in law uh, many of the targets that we're going to need to hit to achieve that uh, enhanced uh, environment. So the government's doing stuff. Um, the Environment Agency is playing its part. Uh, we help design um, that 25-year environment plan. We will be key in delivering it. Uh, we regulate industry, uh, water companies, farming, to uh, ensure that they don't uh, pollute the environment uh, with uh, outcomes that would hurt human health. Um, we regulate greenhouse gas emitter, emitting industries and uh, that is reducing their emissions uh, and thus the extent of climate change. We uh, build flood defences which help us uh, adapt uh, and become more resilient to the uh, increased risk of flood that climate change is bringing. Um, and because we are a statutory consultee on planning decisions, uh, we're also helping uh, country, the country and uh, cities uh, and planners uh, create more resilient places uh, for people to live. Now, as we're doing all these things, we're trying to keep health and well-being in mind. Um, uh, example, um, our, uh, when we build flood schemes now, we try to think of them not just as a flood scheme, a flood defence uh, wall, but as a, as a beauty scheme, as a nature scheme, as a health scheme. So. Uh, example, Warrington, uh, we just uh, last year or two uh, launched a new flood scheme there. Um, not only does it protect over 2,000 homes and businesses, um, but it's also designed to create uh, reed bed habitats. To uh, It's got new trees, we've opened up riverside paths, we've improved the views across the river and across the town. Um, that benefits air quality, obviously it benefits recreation and it benefits um, other healthcare outcomes. Uh, you can calculate the cost of the benefit of that. Um, the benefits are over £70 million over the lifetime of the scheme in terms of uh, healthcare, uh, healthcare costs saved. So um, uh, we're, doing, we're doing stuff, the government's doing stuff. Um, you, many of the audience uh, on, this, uh, on this event today, are doing a huge amount. Uh, I'm incredibly grateful that um, scientists, uh, including the two distinguished uh, professors in front of me, are doing the research that you are doing. Uh, on the links between uh, the environment uh, and human health. That's vital. Um, uh, you, the audience, the rest of you, uh, you're doing something important by just showing up for this speech to register your interest. Um, I think it's fantastic um, that uh, GPs uh, are increasingly uh, moving to social prescribing. So rather than uh, giving patients drugs, uh, they are prescribing walking, uh, gardening or, or other activities uh, to alleviate uh, mental and physical uh, ailments. Uh, so a lot's happening uh, and there's one final point uh, I wanted to make before I finish which relates to if you like the immediate crisis that we're all um, uh, managing which is coronavirus. Um, lockdown uh, did uh, stop at least temporarily or reduce many of the things that threaten our health so traffic noise, vehicle emissions, um, it reminded us all uh, how important nature is as a source of healing, uh, mental as well as physical um, the active travel that many people are going to be doing now, walking, cycling, uh, it doesn't just reduce the infection risk on public transport, but it obviously provides health benefits. And, and I think the government's commitment uh, post-coronavirus to build back better for a green recovery 
uh, offers us the prospect not just of sustainable growth but of better health too and that is that is a fantastic place to be um, finally um, uh, that's the summary I've given you the sort of 10 uh, 10 uh, second uh, 10 minute uh, version um, if you want uh, the uh, the shorter version um, it's this uh, in 10 seconds uh, you can only have healthy humans if you have a healthy planet uh, when we damage nature uh, we damage people uh, if we look after nature uh, it will look after us it costs money but it's the best possible investment we could make because if we make that investment in nature the benefit cost ratio is fantastic not just uh, in the costs that we save for the nhs but in the lives that we save for our communities and the future that we save for our planet thank you well thank you very much james and i'm sure that at this point there would be um heartfelt and enthusiastic applause so uh, my my really warm thanks to you it is extraordinary to me as someone who's been active in these issues for at least 40 years that we're taking so long to learn this lesson i mean i'm an economist and we clearly don't invest anything like enough in the healthy environment despite these very great returns that you've just talked about so there we are, that's a, that's a conundrum, which we may or may not like to address later. But I'd like to talk, uh, turn now to the discussant uh, of, uh, of James's talk, who is, as I said earlier, Professor Joanna Chataway. Um, she is now head of the Department of Science, Technology, Engineering and Public Policy at UCL. We were fortunate enough to be able to lure her from the Science Policy Research Unit SPRU um, at the University of Sussex, where she was also Professor of Science and Technology Policy there. Um, and she's worked, and this is particularly appropriate to the event today, as the Director of the Health, Innovation and Science Research Group at RAND Europe and has been a professor at the Open University. She's leading uh, a UK uh, research funded uh, study on science, technology, and innovation for the Sustainable Development Goals, which obviously um, number three is all about health, uh, with colleagues at SPRU. Um, and this is a, a global study, um, uh, but obviously it applies as much to the UK as to anywhere else. So, Joe, it's uh, terrific to have you with us. And uh, please, over to you now for your thoughts on what, uh, what James has just said. Well, hello, and thank you so much for asking me to be the discussant uh, uh, today. Uh, I, um, I've, I've read the report briefly, I haven't had it too long, um, but listened with, with great interest to uh, the talk that Sir James has given us. Um, Sir James started by saying he felt outgunned, and uh, that certainly is not the case. Uh, first of all, I think many of us will appreciate and admire much of what's in the document that Sir James is launching today. And second, uh, many of us, especially those of us working in the area of public policy, are totally aware of the limitations of the work we do as academics in achieving the change that we need. You're on the front line, Sir James, and, and we very much respect that. Um, so James finished his introduction to this new strategy by saying you can only have healthy humans if you have a healthy planet. And I'm sure that's true. And there is plenty of evidence to uh, back up that statement. And you went on to say that, the, uh, that, that looking after nature costs money, but it's a really great investment. Um, perhaps the best investment we could make because the benefit cost ratio is fantastic. And you know, not just costs saved for the NHS, but in lives saved for our communities, and a future save for our planet. That makes so much sense to me and I'm sure will resonate strongly with others in this virtual room. Uh, you also said that during the lockdown, many of us came to appreciate the importance of the environment to our mental and physical health. And I've certainly appreciated uh, my uh, local woods and parks as, uh, as, as never before really during the past few months. And I, you know, I'm, I, having access to them has made uh, a difference to my resilience and I'm sure again many of us will intuitively uh, take from that the importance of the environment to our to our health. Uh, you said Sir James that scientists and, he and health researchers are already moving in the direction of the kind of broadening out of the health agenda 
uh, to include environmental and equity concerns that you think is so important. And UCL, of course, has a well-established record in this area. And it's core to the agenda of our new school of the, for the health of the public, which is also launching today, actually, um, and to the departments that Paul and I lead. So we can testify to the way that researchers and universities are beginning to link health uh, and the environment and to look beyond clinical research and R&D and innovation for health products, including pharmaceuticals, of course, as the only source of, of improved health. So the new document that you're uh, launching today makes the argument uh, for us to look at the determinants of health uh, and bringing those determinants into our understanding of health and how to achieve it. And it's so interesting that the document um, points to an early WHO definition of health, which makes that point so eloquently. In 1948, the WHO defined health as a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. But it is the case, uh, unfortunately in some respects, fortunate uh, in other respects it could be argued, that in recent decades our dominant approach to promoting health has tended to be much narrower than this. Uh, it's, it's focused on treating and curing ill health and on our sick and unhealthy rather than on more preventative action. Of course we need to care for our sick, of course we do, there's no question about that. Um, but, the, but, the, but the document that you are launching today is ambitious because it gives us a much broader focus on health and, and hones in on the multiple connections between health and inequality uh, and, and, and the environment. It points to deep institutional change that we need uh, if we're to conceive of health in that in that broader way so not just thinking in terms of the national health service and social care but but in broader terms so that's the first challenge i think that's associated with what you've laid out today uh, that encouragement for a broader understanding of what kinds of institutions organizations we need to keep us healthy a broadening out of the remix of the scope of the networks which we will uh, need, which will allow for refocusing and reframing of activity. So, of course, the way in which we understand the relevance and scope of environmental protection and sustainability is also changed in this strategic vision. As you said, Sir James, the economic impact of health improvements from environmental protection is likely to be very significant. And investing in, in the environment makes economic sense. It saves the NHS billions of pounds. You've given us an estimate um, uh, that the NHS could save an estimated 2.1 billion every year in, in treatment costs if everyone had access to good quality green space. Makes social sense uh, because those who live in poor environments are also those who have the worst health. Uh, so leveling up the environment, if done in certain ways, can also contribute to leveling up everything else. But it does seem to me we're right at the beginning of being able to generate the kind of data and evidence that we might need to guide the way here for public and private investments and, and particularly in R&D and innovation, which are going to be crucial if we, if we are going to inspire new directions. So that's the second major challenge, generating that data, creating more agility in our policies and investments based on an assessment of outcomes in terms of, the, of, of environment and, and health not just what we're putting in and uh, the outputs, but what, what's actually happening uh, in terms of, of, of health benefits from, uh, from, from new investments is, 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 uh, is a crucial, a crucial uh, area. Um, what, we need to, what do we need to know in terms of what works, what kind of data and evidence can guide action? How do we collect it? Um, I, uh, I think I'll stop there, actually. Um, I just wanted to end by saying, you know, we have, uh, Sir James, you, you, you outline the reasons for optimism, and I think there are many. We're, we're taking these issues much more seriously than we did, but we do have a long way to go. If we look at who the big spenders are in our, on R&D and innovation in the UK at the moment, um, the pharmaceutical industry, great in some respects, is right up there. But, but, but expenditure in, in on the pharmaceutical industry or on pharmaceutical products isn't going to align you know it isn't going to align totally with the strategy that's that's uh, in the document you present you presented here another major spender is the automotive industry and how that aligns to the vision here is also a question we need to be asking i'll stop there 
Well, thank you very much, Joe, indeed, uh, for that. Um, and I mean, I think that's two great initial presentations. And um, I'm going to ask some questions now. Any fears that I may have had that uh, you would be shy about asking questions, I'm pleased to say have been uh, completely dispelled. Um, um, and I'm going to start, it's very helpful when people give their names and, and any background um, about themselves so that uh, I can see where they're coming from. I'm going to start with Madeline Cuff, um, because James mentioned both health inequalities and COVID-19, and her question goes to the heart of that. She, she asks, did COVID-19 exacerbate inequalities in access to nature and green space in the UK? And how can we prevent a repeat of that in the event of a second wave this winter? James. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Madeline. Uh, I will try uh, an answer at that, um, but uh, tell you straight off that I'm not an expert uh, in coronavirus. Uh, uh, I'm sure that many of you are much more um, uh, expert than I am. Um, did coronavirus exacerbate um, uh, health uh, inequalities and uh, access to green space? Uh, almost certainly yes. Um, we know that uh, coronavirus uh, has been much more uh, devastating for uh, BAME uh, communities, uh, for example. Um, uh, we know that um, uh, those communities uh, tend to be uh, in parts of the country where there isn't uh, a lot of access uh, to green space or blue space. Uh, and actually quite a lot of those communities are the ones that are now back in lockdown uh, and are therefore less able than they even were uh, to access that green uh, and blue space, which is uh, going to deliver health benefits. So I'm sure there have been um, some negative consequences in terms of uh, access to the environment and the longer term benefits that flow from that uh, for uh, excluded or deprived um, communities. Uh, what do we do about it? Well, I think we need to uh, recognise that there's an issue and, and part of, uh, as I and uh, Professor Chatterway are saying, part of the, the point of talking about this uh, is not just to talk about it, but to get action, to change the way that um, key people think and key people uh, act uh, about this. Um, we need to know more, obviously, about coronavirus. There's a lot we still don't know. Um, uh, but we need more research on, on, on that. Um, uh, we need, uh, I think, to internalise this point that, um, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of decisions that we make, uh, including in government, including big funding decisions, that actually a rational use of X billion pounds is not necessarily putting it straight into the National Health Service, which is a fantastic service, um, but might be uh, putting some of that into cleaning up water or improving uh, air quality or supporting uh, electric vehicles. All of those things which would have big benefits for the environment, you might actually find would have a bigger benefit uh, for health than just giving the money uh, to, uh, to, the, to the NHS. Um, and I guess uh, I'll finish by saying um, one of the things I like about this, this environment with um, distinguished academics um, and, and researchers is because I, I do think we need to combine these two worlds uh, and, and our two professors do this very well. Um, I, I, will, I will ration myself to one Karl Marx quote because um, I went to Sussex University in the 70s. It was very important that you could quote uh, Marx, Engels and Trotsky and I can, uh, though I'm not a fan of any of them. Um, but uh, the, the Marx quote that I like uh, is the point is not simply to understand the world. The point is to change it. Uh, but you do need to understand the world, including through data and evidence and analysis, if you're going to make the right interventions to change it. Thank you very much, James. Um, Joe, do you want to come back on uh, come back on that one? How we get what what happens in a second wave? How we, can we avoid these inequalities? Well, I think it's a it, it's a great question to ask, um, and I, I I do think in the first wave we did see uh, uh, the impact in very stark ways of, of COVID-19 on, uh, on, on vulnerable populations, on uh, populations which um, are, are poorer. In a second wave, I think that should, uh, that, that, that could inform the kinds of interventions that, that we make to support communities. I think there could be a, a, a greater focus on making sure that uh, that, that communities who don't um, automatically have access to the kind of resources uh, that other wealthier parts of the country do are supported to get there, what that means in terms of 
uh, the precise organization of lockdown transport facilities uh, and so on um, is, is, is a question uh, that we need to address. And I think asking the question is an important start. Fine, thank you. Yes, I'd agree. I've, I'd, it struck me almost at the time that, that it was extremely, um, <laughs> well, it wasn't at all true to say we're all in this together. Um, certain people had a much better time and a much easier time than others. Um, let's move on though. Uh, James mentioned a couple of practical things. I'm going to come to, to sort of practical action oriented questions in a minute. So, so thank you for those. But I, I do just want to ask this one, which comes from an anonymous attendee. Um, and uh, he or she asks, COVID-19 showed us how quickly the world can act when events are perceived as an emergency. Do you have any thoughts on how we can increase the perception of climate environment emergency to encourage more significant action? Uh, okay, thanks. Um, so um, here I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote some more um, uh, Marxist, uh, Marxists. Uh, I'm gonna quote Leon Trotsky at you, um, uh, who, who said many dumb things, but the one thing that he said that I, I will always, I've always remembered is, um, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. Uh, so that's a way of saying, there are lots of people around the world who are not particularly interested in climate change. Uh, there are many people who don't think it's happening. It doesn't matter um, because climate change is interested in them. Uh, we need all of us to uh, help everyone around the world understand that um, uh, this is not a, an academic debate. This is not a theory. The, these are facts which are changing the world in which we live. So people need to understand that um, climate change will mean, it's already mean, meant um, uh, higher tides, um, higher seas as the, as the polar ice caps and the glaciers melt. Now, uh, if you live uh, on a coastal uh, zone and much of the world's population does, uh, climate change is interested in you because your coastal zone is under threat. Uh, we know that the climate emergency is bringing more extreme and more violent weather. So uh, if you live near a river, uh, then climate change is interested in you because there is now a greater threat uh, of flooding from that river than there was, and that threat will uh, increase. Uh, and if you use water, and everybody uh, in this world does, um, then climate change is interested in you because climate change is also posing uh, increasing threats to water security. So uh, how, do we, how do we unite the world around what is manifestly the biggest challenge uh, for humanity? I think we have to tell the story. Uh, I think we have to make it real. You know, it's not a theory, it's coming for you. I think critically we have to, uh, we have to encourage people not to give up. The, the worst thing we could do is to conclude that the, it's all too difficult and there's nothing that we, we could do about this. That, that is wrong. Uh, we know what the uh, solutions are to climate change. It's very simple. We need to uh, reduce uh, our carbon output, uh, which is what's driving it. Uh, and we need to uh, enhance the resilience of, of our economy, uh, our lifestyles uh, and, and the places that we live. That's, that's not rocket science, that's actually quite simple. Uh, what it requires is political will uh, and unity of purpose. Uh, and I guess the final thing I would say is that um, we need to connect, we need to, people need to understand that they have agency. It doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can do stuff in your own life and in your own lifestyle that will make things better. You know, we need to have fewer things, <laughs> we need to reuse them, uh, we need to recycle them, um, we need to uh, eat differently, um, we need to uh, walk to places um, rather than drive, uh, we need to uh, switch the lights off um, uh, when they're on. So there are a, a whole number of things that we can all do in our individual lives, as well as, as political actors, to tackle the climate emergency. And uh, I'm actually quite optimistic, more so than I was even a year ago about this, because my sense is that more and more people, and not just young people, more and more people can feel in their bones that something's changing. Uh, and more and more people are determined that we should do something about it. And those people are putting pressure on the politicians. And ultimately, you know, my experience with politicians is ultimately, um, after having exhausted all the alternatives, they'll do the right thing. Well, thanks very much, James, for that uh, optimistic view. And, and obviously, uh, I've absolutely endorsed the fact that uh, the, the, the worst possible thing is to think you can't do anything, um, because then we, then we can be certain that, that the worst is going to happen. 
Um, Joe, do you want to do you want to come in on that one? Just quickly, I think Leon Trotsky uh, was also an advocate of permanent revolution, um, which uh, is is interesting uh, in, in in thinking about the, this question, and it's it's the crucial question, I think. How do we uh, learn uh, to, 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 bake, to bake in the agility, the adaptability, which we have seen over the past few months in a stunning way? What is it that, that allowed people to move so quickly? And, and what can we take into the future uh, in, in terms of lessons learned, which will uh, allow us to respond to our assessment of what's working? Uh, in positive terms and in negative terms um, more rapidly. I think that, that, that um, we've learned so much over the past few months about how we can uh, think about that question in terms of the way our institutions, our organizations and our regulation uh, works. Um, so I, I think the key there is, is, is balancing permanent revolution with some kind of environment that allows people to, to actually get on with stuff. Um, uh, it, but, but, but maintaining a focus on agility and adaptability. Okay, thanks, Joe. And, and here comes now a question uh, that is very much about getting on with stuff. Um, and it comes from Jill Attenborough, and she's CEO of the Country Trust. And she asks, is there a UK campaign, including practical action, ideally, exclamation mark, that we as charities can get behind to increase access to good quality green space for the most disadvantaged communities. Who is taking the lead on what seems to be a foundation stone for better health for all? James. So that is, that is a really good question because I think it kind of puts, puts its finger on, on part of the problem because I don't think anybody is uh, taking lead uh, or responsibility for fixing the problem. There are lots of different uh, cooks in this kitchen and, you know, we're some of them, um, but uh, I don't yet feel that, uh, you know, the country uh, or more, more broadly the global community has really kind of either internalised that this is the thing, this is the big thing, this is the thing that, that really needs to be focused on, uh, investing in nature for better outcomes for people's health and for our long term uh, economic uh, security. Um, and I, I'm not sure that not just in this country, but around the world, we have uh, you know, institutions uh, who feel it to be their responsibility uh, or that we have um, organisations that have the funding uh, or the mandate to do the things that um, your questioner is rightly saying um, uh, need done. And, you know, this is a bit, this report today from the Environment Agency is a bit left field for us. Um, we don't usually um, uh, get into the health space. Uh, and to be honest, there are a few um, uh, people from outside the, our organisation that were counselling us against uh, doing this. Um, uh, I think it's worth taking a risk because I think it's just too important not to have the debate. Um, but I think the, the basic problem is that there isn't, there isn't any single organisation or person in this country who is responsible for ensuring that everybody gets access to uh, the green space that they need. Um, and maybe there should be. Yeah, really interesting. Um, I mean, one of my favourite charities in this area, uh, Jill, is called the Open Spaces Society and they try to ensure that the, um, uh, the green spaces we do have access to don't get shut down by various malign forces, which are always seem to be trying to do that. So um, there's a little plug for them. Uh, Joe, any thoughts about, uh, 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 about practical action for green spaces? Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't have much to add up to, to what Sir James has said on that. I, I, I think it would be uh, of benefit to have an, uh, an institutional remit which focused on, on, on that issue. But um, yeah. Right. Okay. Well, let's turn to another practical one then um, uh, from Tony Lee uh, from Mind, which of course is a mental health charity. Uh, and he asks, uh, does the EA have any plans to work with stakeholders in the mental health sector to build the resilience of the British public to new and existing health challenges that will be caused or exacerbated by climate change? Wow. Um, so first thing to say is I'm a big fan of mind. Um, uh, they have been kind enough to um, uh, give us various awards over the last few years for the way that the Environment Agency has um, 
talked about uh, mental health uh, amongst their own staff and prioritised that as much as physical health. So we're grateful to mine for their support uh, and advice uh, about that. I do think, again, as the previous question was saying, there's a, there's a big challenge there with nobody sort of manifestly ready to accept it. Um, but the premise of the question that um, climate change is not just damaging our physical health, but is uh, damaging mental health is absolutely right. I mean, there, there is lots of evidence that we are seeing more uh, psychological uh, and mental uh, problems arising, um, either directly or indirectly, because people are worried by or experiencing things that are caused by um, climate change. Um, what does that mean? I think, you know, I don't think we necessarily need, um, you know, a specific uh, organization uh, or person to uh, deal solely with people's concerns about climate change. I think we need to tackle climate change itself uh, and we need to make sure that uh, in the world that we live in now we are uh, respectful of and supportive of and prepared to talk openly about uh, mental health and I think MIND play a huge part in that and you know we'd love to, to, to learn more about how we could work with them um, on the issues that uh, your question has just raised. Go yeah, well, on mental health, your experiences on that. So I, I, I think the focus of the question was on the type of stakeholder engagement that might be envisioned. And I do think um, that's absolutely critical. If we are uh, to really adopt this uh, broader definition of, of health and the way we need to meet health challenges in that broader definition, we need to ask people. We need to gather, it needs to be part of our strategy to gather the data, to constantly engage with different communities um, ab about, about what's working and, and what needs addressing. Um, and surely mental health is, is absolutely critical in, in that respect. We need to understand much more about what it is that uh, works to link health environment and uh, addressing challenges in mental health um, on the basis of, of, of stakeholder engagement and participation. Paul, if I could just add just one other thought to that, because um, I think it's helpful. Um, in my experience, one of the things you need to do uh, to persuade the Treasury to uh, spend money is show them the maths. You've got to demonstrate to, there's a fantastic benefit cost ratio in, in that outlay. And that's a very good challenge. And one of the problems we've had in this whole area uh, where we all know that there is a link between good environment and good health outcomes is the data that demonstrates convincingly to the Treasury that you save money by putting it into nature. Increasingly we're getting that data. So example on um, mental health uh, for our mind uh, colleague. Um, last winter we had serious flooding as you will remember. Um, uh, we had about four and a half thousand homes and businesses flooded. Um, every one of those is a personal tragedy and many of those people who are flooded will suffer some kind of mental uh, health uh, issue. Um, Environment Agency defences at the same time protected another 130,000 homes and businesses which would have flooded from flooding. Now, uh, we've done the maths and we know that the, uh, the direct healthcare cost in terms of mental health treatment for those people who did experience mental health issues as a result of this winter's flooding was about £20 million. We also know that the amount of money saved to the NHS and Associated Services for mental health expenditure that we didn't have to make because 130,000 homes and businesses were not flooded comes to 580 million pounds and these are exactly the kind of figures that you need to give the treasury in order to persuade them to invest in flood defenses uh, other things that mitigate climate change uh, so the more evidence the more numbers uh, we can get that put put a figure on it the better place we'll all be to make the arguments that i think we all think need to be made well, thanks, James. That, that leads kind of very nicely into a couple of other questions we've had about this issue of costs and benefits. Um, one of them comes from Celia Hickson, and she asks, uh, how does the EA calculate monetary benefits based around perceived health benefits? I mean, one answer I could say is, uh, Celia, come and do my MSc course, because that's one of the things we teach, but that's not terribly helpful in the current context. Um, and I would like then to ask also the question from Carol Dalla, um, uh, which relates to, to how these numbers are received. And she asks, is the reason for lack of investment in nature the time lag between the cost, which is short term, in other words, the money we have to spend now, and the benefits which come in the long term sometimes, despite this very low 
cost benefit ratio that you're talking about or or high benefit costs ratio which is uh, how one could also express it so two questions there um, how do you come up with these numbers that you've just given us James and why does no one pay attention to them <laughs> well the, the the numbers are derived um, from a, a fairly simple and probably because I haven't done your MSc course a fairly crude and unsophisticated model uh, that essentially um, you know tops up uh, how much uh, on average it costs uh, the NHS to treat uh, someone with a mental health issue, how much it costs to treat someone with a particular physical uh, issue, uh, how many uh, of those uh, occurrences happen following a flood, for example, if we're calculating the benefit cost ratio of flood defence, um, and uh, what the, the cost of avoiding uh, those, uh, those costs is. So uh, I'm sure that's a very crude uh, measure, um, and I'm sure we can be more sophisticated, but it does produce some fairly convincing numbers uh, and I think however you calculate it, we will end up with numbers that demonstrate there is a high benefit cost ratio to investing in uh, nature. Um, uh, the, the second question is a really interesting one. You know, why, why when, at least to us, it's kind of self-evident that it's a good investment uh, to uh, enhance nature, um, uh, does it not get more, more funding? Um, I think, what's the answer to that? I think, I think it is partly to do, as your questioner said, suggested with the, um, the different timescales in which politicians live. I, I mean, I've actually got quite a lot of time for politicians. I spent most of my adult life with them. Most of them are in politics for the reasons that we're doing what we do. They want to make the world a better place. And they try, most of them, hard to do that. So I don't want to knock politicians, but the nature of the political cycle, at least in Western democracies, is such that most politicians tend to focus on fairly short term uh, issues and how quickly they can deliver an outcome. And if it cannot be delivered within, uh, you know, an electoral cycle, then they tend to be rather less interested by and large. Um, so I think it is partly because, you know, it can take decades for the benefits and associated um, cost reductions and economic advantages to appear uh, of investing in nature. So I think that's part of it. Uh, I think part of it is um, just competing demand. You know, it may, you know, it's been great the way that the NHS has coped with, um, with, with coronavirus. I suspect one downside is, is it has become even more unthinkable uh, to, to not fund the NHS as soon as you have spare money around because everyone thinks the NHS is fantastic, which it is. But I think, I think the, 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 the difficulty for politicians of not funding uh, the NHS versus choosing to fund something else is, is, is a political problem that we just need to kind of uh, recognize. And I think the other, other issue is, is the data. I think it's getting better and, you know, distinguished academics like you are helping us make it better. But until, until we can convince, you know, hard-eyed, flinty-eyed treasury officials that, that, that this is the best use of the taxpayer's pound to go and plant that tree rather than open that hospital, uh, we will find traction difficult. Uh, Joe, from your experience, you interact a lot with policymakers. I mean, how, how do you get them to pay attention to these sorts of things? Well, I, I mean, I do think Sir James is, is right that the um, having the, the, the numbers helps and having the data helps, but it, it certainly isn't. I mean, it's a matter of political will, uh, too. And um, I, I think it harks back to an earlier question about having an institution or, or organisation which sees this as its central concern and, and puts it on the agenda relentlessly and defines every policy question in these terms. And, you know, it's the reference point. Um, I, I think makes, uh, will, will, will be, I think that's beginning to happen. I think we're all uh, much more focused on these issues about the relationship between environment and health than, than we were. And I think um, that's, that's, a, that's essential in, in getting the action that we we, we want, it's, uh, it's a matter of rejigging organizational and institutional remits to, to, to guide that action. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's, let's move on and, and come back to something which James mentioned uh, very strongly in his speech, which, which is about inequalities in health. And we have a question here from Maddie Horton Bokes. And she asks, and then I'm gonna put in a, a second question from someone else. She asked that the inequalities in health and where the impacts of pollution are a symptom of systemic and social inequalities that also play out in the institutions represented here. How can we ensure that we're fully tackling these inequalities 
by examining the ways in which this work is being done and who is steering this work. And the related questions come from Maxwell Ayamba, who sent, uh, sent a number of questions in in advance of the meeting, all to do with the fact, I mean, as James said, um, the, the communities that, that have been uh, worst hit by COVID-19, uh, among them are, are the BAME communities, um, uh, there are also those who, who tend to be on the sharp end of many environmental issues. Uh, and yet in the environment movement, we don't see a very high representation of um, black and ethnic mi minority people. And, and I mean, that's a, that's a paradox. And uh, uh, Maxwell asked a number of questions as to why that was. I mean, are we institutionally and systemically racist? Um, uh, and perhaps more importantly, uh, if we're not getting the diversity that we would like, what can we do about it? And um, so really those, those two sorts of things about inequalities uh, and diversity and uh, how the EA might respond to that both in its own work and giving leadership to the environment movement generally. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, th those are both really uh, important uh, and in some cases, in some ways quite troubling questions because I think they do point to a, a deep truth, which is that, as uh, your last question said, um, you know, much of the environmental movement and indeed m most of the NGO world, um, which because the NGO world plays an important part in the environment movement, uh, does not have um, uh, a, a proper representation from black, Asian, minority, ethnic and other uh, other communities. Uh, that, that is an undoubted fact um, and that's a bad thing. Um, uh, why is it a bad thing? Well, at first it's a bad thing because uh, actually um, around the world it is the most excluded, uh, the dispossessed, um, the less well off. Uh, often it may be um, uh, in European countries, uh, black, Asian and minority, ethnic communities who are suffering worst uh, from the climate emergency, who suffer the worst health outcomes as we've discussed. So there's a, there's a justice point there. Um, there's also a fixing it point because I just don't think that you make uh, good decisions unless you have a diversity of perspective around, around your table. Uh, and if um, uh, the environmental movement, or, or for that matter the environment agency, uh, is a bunch of middle-aged white men talking to each other, that is unlikely to uh, either uh, uh, understand uh, many of the interests of, uh, of others who are not around that table or come out with, with solutions that are going to work for everybody. So I think it's a, it's a real issue, I think it's a real problem. Um, uh, what do we do about it? Um, well what the Environment Agency is doing about it is a bunch of things. Um, so uh, we have about 4%, 4.5% of our um, staff are from black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. Uh, that is far too low. Um, uh, it's probably the, the, the thing I'm most unhappy about in terms of the Environment Agency, which in many respects is a very good organisation. Um, we've set ourselves a deliberately audacious target, 14, 1-4% of our staff to be um, black, Asian and minority ethnic. That is not uh, uncoincidentally the same proportion as there are BAME people in the British uh, working population and we think we should be aiming uh, to, to replicate and represent all of Britain. So we've set ourselves a pretty audacious goal. Um, we go out and we work hard um, to encourage um, people from black, Asian and minority ethnic communities to come and work for us. And we found that uh, the old ways of doing it don't work. You, you know, you put an advert in, in, in a newspaper, uh, it doesn't work. Uh, you have to go out to the communities, you have to work with members of those communities. Um, uh, you have to uh, understand what motivates those communities um, in order for you to start to make headway. Uh, and we have found that going and talking to uh, BAME communities uh, going out to colleges uh, where there is a high proportion of BAME students uh, is the best way to start to connect with people who, who we want to come and work for us because it'll, uh, it'll make us better. And finally, um, I have um, actually since the Black Lives Matter thing, which is a big moment for us and, and of course for many people, uh, not just in this country but across the world, one of the things uh, I've done um, uh, with support from our um, Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic uh, Network in, in the Environment Agency is bring on to my executive uh, board uh, a representative of our Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic uh, Network so that uh, we have voices around the table that are different and that understand different perspectives because I think that way we'll end up 
uh, with better outcomes, not just on who we recruit, but on how we tackle the big challenges we're talking about today. Um, I want to move on to, to three policy questions now. And, and James, I'm aware that it's not the EA's job to make policy. It's your job to, uh, to apply, implement policy and enforce it. But nevertheless, you can say what you feel you want to say uh, in response to these three questions. One is from uh, an anonymous attendee, which is very brief. And uh, he asks, or she asks, what's your take on the risks to the environment posed by the proposed changes to the planning system? which is obviously a pretty important set of issues. Then we have a question from Dom Higgins, um, and he's head of health and education at the Wildlife Trusts. So thank you, Dom, for joining us. And he's asking what practical action can be taken to prioritize where access to nature is created or improved to tackle the health and social inequalities mentioned by the speakers. So practical action to prioritize where access to nature is created. And then finally, a question from um, David Rhodes, uh, which my questions keep hopping up and down as more people ask them, but that, yeah, here it is. And, and he's director of uh, environmental public health at Public Health England. So really nice to have made the connection with another statutory body that's actually concerned with human health this time. And um, uh, he's, um, uh, it's quite a long question. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm just going to ask the question, which is that if you could choose just one policy or action that would have benefits for health, nutrition, the environment, and economic recovery, just a small ask there, what would it be? And uh, Joe, I'm going to come to you with those there, so you may like to get your thinking hat to, on to. Goodness. Um... Right, okay, uh, I'll, I'll, let me try and tackle those. I, I, I'd rather that Joe was going first because that will give me more time to think of the answers, but I will, I will, I will, I will, go, I will go first. Okay, um, planning system. So I guess the first thing to say is, uh, you know, I learned this in India, we cannot, we cannot um, pose a choice uh, to the world between on the one hand um, uh, protecting and enhancing the environment um, and on the other uh, growth because uh, if, you, if you frame it in that way, people will go for growth. You know, there are, there are billions of people around the world lifting themselves out of absolute poverty, and that is a good thing. I've seen it, it's fantastic, it needs to keep going. So we need to have policies that allow us in this country and around the world to deliver both sustainable growth and improved uh, environmental outcomes. And I think we can. Uh, an example I quoted this morning on the radio is the, uh, the Thames Tideway Tunnel. Um, which is a massive infrastructure project uh, under the River Thames uh, in London that will move sewage, which currently drops into the river um, when it rains, um, down through instead through a pipeline down through East London where it will be processed. And the thing about the Thames Tideway Tunnel, but it's just one example, is it's a great example of having both of these things. So it's a massive investment project. Uh, it's creating a huge amount of jobs and growth. It's very innovatory, so it's pushing the boundaries of, of science and technology with very low carbon concrete. Um, all that's growth tick, but it's also a massive uh, investment in an improved environment because it'll do wonders uh, for the water quality in the River Thames. And, uh, you know, that is an example of where we can have both the growth that we need and uh, enhanced environment. And I think as policymakers or, or, or actors or participants or practitioners, uh, we will always fail if we try and uh, ask the country to choose between one or the other. We're, we're best if we can deliver, uh, demonstrate that we can deliver both. Uh, I think there are um, risks in uh, changing the planning system. Um, we, you know, it's, it's a matter for the government how they change it. They, clearly they want to uh, turbocharge house building. We understand that. Uh, we are a key player in that because we're a statutory consultee uh, in major developments. Um, I think all I would say is um, whether, it's, whether it turns out to be good or bad for the environment depends on how it's implemented. Uh, the government has said it wants a green recovery. Um, let us take it at its word and make sure that it does. Um, and let's make sure that the people who can contribute to that, including the Environment Agency, continue to have a, a, a good say uh, on what planning decisions are made. At the moment, 99% uh, of the planning decisions that we get asked uh, to comment on go in line with our advice. So that's a, that's a good statistic. I hope that that uh, will remain. Uh, how, second question, how to prioritise um, uh, where we improve access to nature. 
I think, again, this gets back to um, who's actually in charge of this. I don't think anybody is thinking coherently about this. Um, I think the data will help. Uh, the more data we have, the more we can apply the 80-20 rule and focus on the 20% of interventions that make 80% of the difference. So more data, uh, please. Uh, finally, the, the PHE question. Um, uh, firstly, I'm a big fan of PHE. Uh, we work closely with them and you know what they do to um, uh, promote well-being uh, and good health uh, is, is just as, if not more important, than all the things that are being done to tackle um, uh, all the existing medical conditions. So solidarity with PHE. Um, what's the single, if I could make one intervention? Well, I think at short notice, um, I would say water. Um, and I say that because um, I remember just after I arrived as chief executive, uh, the very wise um, boss of, a, of, a, of an environmental charity said to me, you know, James, the thing about water is that it gets everywhere. And uh, this sounds a bit kind of um, dumb, but actually it's quite a profound truth. It does get everywhere. Um, and what you put in it gets everywhere. Uh, and how much there is of it is fundamental, uh, too much, too little to, to everything else. So I think if I had to invest in one thing that would um, done right, deliver both fantastic uplift to the environment uh, and uh, improve our economy and health, health outcomes and all the other things, it would be water. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. Joe. do you want to add anything to any of that? Uh, yeah, on the last question, I think um, if you look back over the last uh, century, uh, the big differences it, to health have been from public health interventions and from vaccines. Uh, there, there's a lot of data to suggest those two, pri th those two sets of, uh, of innovations of interventions have made the, the, the defining difference in terms of health. I think we've taken our eye off the ball. Uh, in terms of, of prevention and, and public health interventions, I will formulate a policy agenda around uh, preventative uh, measures to be taken to say to, to build a WHO uh, vision of, of health. And um, uh, I, th I don't think there is actually one policy intervention, but I think there's a policy uh, framework that can be developed around that, which will bring organizations uh, uh, together, institutions together, and drive a new policy agenda around that. Right, well, thank you very much. Um, we're coming kind of to an end because uh, James has, has a hard stop at 1.45, and that gives us just a few more minutes. Uh, you mentioned right at the beginning, James, that air pollution was, was top of the, 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 the environment health uh, kind of links that we've got. I've got three questions here on, on air pollution. Um, which uh, I, I, I'm going to ask. Uh, one is from Pale Gibson, which may be a typo, and it perhaps should be Paul Gibson, but I don't know. And uh, the question there is, to improve air quality, does the Environment Agency need more powers to help influence the social and cultural change that will be needed? If so, what powers would be required then there's a question from Chris Large on uh, air pollution causes a terrible health burden in the UK, as you found. So what can enforcement agency like the EA do to reduce air pollution if the current regulations permit polluters to collectively emit pollution, which adds up to dangerous levels of air pollution? Um, and he makes the point earlier in the question that most polluters are largely operating within the rules and, and he excludes Dieselgate from that. And then the third question, uh, which is quite close to my heart from the Bartlett, of course, because I've got lots of colleagues who work on this. Does the environment include the internal environment, homes, offices and buildings? Air quality can be much worse indoors than outside. And of course, ventilation systems pose a special threat now to, to with, with COVID-19, et cetera, which is one of the things we're working on. So three rather different questions there, but two of them basically about powers and enforcement. And then the third one uh, about the internal environment and whether that's your game at all. Uh, so um, we don't regulate inside people's houses to uh, I'll answer the last question first, but I, we do uh, factor in uh, the uh, impact of being inside buildings as well as outside buildings on people's uh, health uh, when we're uh, looking at these matters. And as we've said before, um, the, you know, the personal is political. Things that we do in our own homes 
can have immense uh, benefits or disbenefits for tackling climate emergency or improving the environment. So what we do inside our homes is just as important, if not more so, than what we do outside. Um, on the first question, um, do, we, uh, do we need more powers um, uh, to tackle air quality? Um, I think the questioner is right that, that, that I think this is, a, this is a, 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 an issue on which you know, some of the solution is, is with the regulators, some of the solution is with government, but quite a lot of the solution is, is with what individuals choose to do and not do. Um, actually, um, we've been quite successful, over, very successful over the last 20 years or so, in terms of bearing down on air pollution where there is a regulatory framework uh, and we have the powers and resources to, to regulate properly. So uh, air pollution from uh, big industrial installations, from uh, steel works, uh, from uh, intensive farming, uh, significantly reduced because we do have those powers and those resources and there's a legal framework with the right targets. Um, the main problem uh, right now um, in driving air pollution is not, is not pollutants coming from those, uh, those industrial uh, sources, it's, it's vehicles, it's traffic. Um, and that is susceptible uh, uh, not of an easy regulatory um, solution. There are a whole bunch of interventions that you might need to make. Some of them will be technical, they'll be to do with what, what specifications you want to insist on for vehicles. But quite a lot of them will be um, social and cultural change. Um, you know, where it is no longer acceptable to drive a car that pollutes, uh, where it is no longer uh, socially acceptable to, to use a vehicle if you can walk. Um, and I think, I think those changes can happen. You know, I've seen in my lifetime immense changes in how people feel about smoking uh, or dropping litter. And I think we can and, and must make some of those uh, changes. But those are not things that I think the Environment Agency can regulate for. I think those are for all of us um, as kind of social uh, actors. Finally, on the question about, um, another good question about how to uh, reduce pollution where, where the regulatory framework doesn't exist or where it allows um, uh, pollution. Actually, um, you know, as I think I've been saying, my experience is that where there is a regulatory framework, and there is in relation to these big installations that previously were damaging air quality, uh, we've been very successful at improving air quality. Uh, and, and actually, that, that's not the problem now. Um, the problem, as I've said, is the unre unregulated bits of, uh, of, of the economy, vehicles, some forms of farming, uh, where there isn't a regulatory framework. And uh, until we do have uh, a framework for that, until we have powers, and until we have uh, some resources, which at the moment we don't, um, it will be hard to tackle. Thanks very much, James. Joe, thoughts on air quality? I don't think I have much to add on that uh, wonderful answer that, that Sir James gave us. I think air quality is absolutely critical and, um, and getting point to, back to the point you made earlier, Sir James, there's, there's really not a trade-off here uh, in terms of uh, growth and, uh, and, and uh, environmental protection. They need to go hand in hand um, and, and that needs to be very much at the centre of, of, of the way we conceive of the problems and, and that's very much what, what, what you've outlined there. So I don't have much to add. Okay, um, I've got a couple of minutes left on my clock and I've got 19 questions. So clearly there are some people who aren't gonna get their questions asked. Thank you so much for being so participative, everybody. I'd like to finish with a question from Anna Glazer from DEFRA, where she's linking uh, the very important issues you've been talking about to one that hasn't come up yet. And she asks, does the report make any link between biodiversity loss and human health? Then she talks a bit about the Dasgupta review, that we must stop viewing human behavior in isolation from the planet that we live on. How can we make sure we're joining up all of this important research? So thanks, Anna, for that. So, uh, great question, Anna. Um, uh, we work very closely with, with DEFRA. Um, short answer, yes. Um, the report does uh, identify a clear link between um, uh, biodiversity and health, um, uh, which is um, di diversity is good. Uh, just as diversity is good for you know, groups and organisations, diversity is a good thing for nature. Um, uh, it, uh, what the report shows is that um, people who uh, are brought up uh, in, uh, uh, in environments in which there is a wider uh, range of flora and fauna, classically kids who grow up on farms, 
um, have better uh, health, um, including on specific conditions like asthma, than people who are brought up in environments where there are monocultures or are much less uh, biodiversity. So, uh, you know, not only uh, do we need to cherish and restore our biodiversity because that's beautiful and because that's, you know, that's natural capital that we need for the future. But again, as we've been saying for the last hour, that is a fantastic healthcare intervention if we can get that biodiversity back. Joe, a final thought on biodiversity? Oh yeah, what a great question. And of course, biodiversity is, is critical um, to our ability to, uh, to, to uh, create healthy environments in, in the future. It really is, a, it, it, it relates back, I think, to other questions and other issues we've been thinking about in relation to valuing biodiversity. And uh, uh, I think the message has not got across, although there is data there, the, the message has not got across that, that biodiversity is core to our, uh, to, to our potential for economic growth in, in the future. Um, we cannot go on with models that uh, under, uh, undermine um, uh, efforts to preserve biodiversity and promote it. That has to be part of of the way we reframe um, this new uh, connection between env environment and health. It has to be uh, central in there. That has big implications <laughs> for the way that we, we, we do things, but it's absolutely central. I'm so glad you raised it. Huge implications for land use and practically everything else. So, um, uh, James, thank you very much. Just one final thought from the chat. Maddie Horton Brooks, who asked a Bokes, who asked a question earlier, it turns out she comes from CPRE and she says that they're doing lots of work on inequalities in access to the countryside. So, if you're interested in following that up with with CPRE, please do so. And uh, it all that's left to me, really, James, knowing that you've got to fly, um, is to thank you so much for. Um, coming to us to launch your very important report, which I hope is going to be very widely read uh, by both the people who matter and by everybody else, um, so that we do get the legislation we need, so that this generation really is the generation that leaves the environment in a better state uh, after 25 years than, than it found it in. And uh, heaven knows we certainly need that. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much, Joe, for sharing your thoughts um, on, on this from, uh, from your perspective. Uh, thank you to all the participants. We had up to 170 people online at any one time, and I've certainly found that these Zoom conferences are much more inclusive and managed to get a much more diverse audience than we could ever have got if we'd had it in our normal building in Central House. So thank you all for coming and for asking such fascinating questions. Apologies to the 18 people whose questions I just uh, didn't have time to get to. Um, have a wonderful rest of the day and a green future. Thank you all very much indeed. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.